After such a, an amazing reading, I don't really know what I can do. <laughs> we all have one. We have a favorite movie or book where we're surprised at the end and we think, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. I know for me, it was The Usual Suspects. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. I've listened to a number of Agatha Christie audiobooks over the years, and sometimes you get right to the last page or two, and you're like, that? That's, that's the criminal? And I love Habakkuk. Habakkuk is such a unique book in the entire Bible. And when I think of the life of this mysterious prophet, we know really very little about him, I can't help but thinking, he must have had that surprise. I didn't see that coming. So let's take some time to explore the world of Habakkuk today. Well, what do we know about this person? Well, he has a mysterious name. The name means embracer. And it's not a name that appears anywhere else in the Bible. So some people have suggested maybe it's just a name that he chose for himself. Because he felt that in his heart, that's what he was doing through his conversation, his dialogue with God, and then his final reaction to God and to God's message to him. That in spite of all the difficulties and the mystery and in spite of all the questions that still had gone unknown, he was embracing God. His prophecy, his career, what we know of it, probably takes place around the year 589, 590, a couple of years before the Chaldeans or the Babylonians come in and conquer Jerusalem and then take the people out uh, back to what is today Iraq, to Mesopotamia. And we think that probably he was related to the worship in the temple. So maybe he was a Levite who were in charge, who were like the music worship team at the temple in Jerusalem. Maybe he knew music, so maybe he was a Levite. But beyond that, we really don't know anything about this man. But we have a very unique book because it's almost like an interview. Habakkuk starts out by making a complaint against the people. And if you have your Bible with you or your Bible app, let's open to Habakkuk 1. How long, Yahweh, am I to cry for help while you will not listen, to cry oppression in your ear, and you will not save? Why do you set injustice before me? Why do you look on where there is tyranny, outrage, and violence? This is all that I see. All is contention and discord flourishes. Verses 2 and 3. This is a, a, a classical a part of the prophetic role. You know, a lot of people think the prophets, their main role in the life of Israel was to predict the future, and sometimes they, they do that, but that's not really the main thing that the prophets are there for in the divine economy. Their main role is to call Israel to be faithful to the covenant. And here, the prophet is complaining to God. He says, I see, comp- I see oppression. I see violence. The word violence appears like five times throughout this short book, three chapters. I see oppression and violence. I see justice perverted. I see the judges favoring the wealthy and the powerful. And even if the case of the poor and the lowly is the correct one, they go with the powerful party. I see all these things. I see corruption of Torah, of the covenant between God and Israel. And Israel is not being faithful to their part of the pact. And the heart of this prophet is just being torn. It is in pain because of the injustice that he sees all around him. And then we have something very interesting. What does God do? He answers the question. Now, we have a lot of instances throughout Scripture of people complaining to God... Look at your people. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're worshiping idols. They're being corrupt. They're not keeping the Sabbath. We have a lot of examples. But with Habakkuk, God, for whatever reason, says, I'm going to give you an answer. Sometimes the answer is more troubling 
than ignorance. Have you ever found that in life? Sometimes knowing something can be a lot harder than being ignorant of something. That's what happens to Habakkuk. Because God, and I, I encourage you to read the book of Habakkuk later on today or tomorrow or throughout the week. It's not very long. And I'm going to summarize what God says. God says, and he's very proud of his answer, by the way. He's not like, well, Habakkuk, I have bad news for you. I'm going to send the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to crush the people, so there is going to be justice. No. God says, cast your eyes over the nations, look, and be amazed, astounded, for I am doing something in your own days that you would not believe if you were told of it. We love using this verse to talk about good things. But in this case, the original context, it's bad news for the people of God. But the point is that God has heard the complaint of the prophet. He has seen the lack of faithfulness of his people. And he says, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. And then he describes the Chaldeans. And God is like proud of how evil and destructive the Chaldeans are. He has chosen in his sovereignty and his wisdom... He has chosen a cruel nation to punish his own people. Having that knowledge for Habakkuk is harder than the original ignorance. The second question. Look at verse 113. Are you not from ancient times, Yahweh, my God, my Holy One? My Holy One, this is the only time in the entire Bible that we have this very intimate way of speaking to God. My Holy One, who never dies, Yahweh, you have made this people an instrument of justice, set it firm as a rock in order to punish. He's saying, I accept this. You have chosen the Chaldeans to be your instrument of justice. I accept that. I don't understand it, but I accept it. Your eyes are too pure to rest on wickedness. You cannot look on at tyranny. Why do you look on while men are treacherous and stay silent while the evil man swallows a better man than he? Habakkuk has a second question. Let me pause here and tell you something that has become very precious and very important to me over years. We've been missionaries for 18 years and almost all that time has been focused in some way or another on sharing the gospel with Muslims, discipling new believers who came from Islam, um, some apologetics. A lot of it is really just sharing life, just sharing the love of Christ by being friends and, and being open to people. And in Islam, there's a strong tradition that you don't ask questions. You don't ask questions. Because if you ask a question, that's opening a door to doubt. And I love explaining to Muslims that we Christians, at least in our better moments, we're not like that. God is happy to have you ask questions. Now, you can't do it with an arrogant heart. Some people came to Jesus with arrogant questions, and he saw right through them. And I I don't think that was anything particularly supernatural. You know, sometimes you can just tell when someone is, to use a not really a New Testament word, Someone is trolling you, right? Um, Twitter. Okay, we're not going to talk about Twitter. So, sometimes you can just tell that someone is not authentic. They're just asking you because they want to they bother you. And sometimes people will come to Jesus like that, right? Like, well, we have a theological, uh, legal question for you. There were seven brothers, and okay, lever marriage, we know the whole story, and Jesus just shuts them down. But another guy comes to him with a legal question. It's not that different in terms of the kind of question it is. But he's sincere. He says, well, what is the greatest commandment? You know, there's like over 300 or 500 commandments in the Torah, depending on how you count them. And Jesus is like, it's a good question. Because he sees that the guy has a sincere heart. So, we can ask questions of God, but we have to do it with a humble and sincere heart. And that's what Habakkuk is doing. And uh, that's what we see Jesus interacting with. People who have genuine questions, he is happy. He has time for them. And I love telling that to Muslims because that is not the tradition that they have been raised in. God loves it when we ask questions. Now we have to do it with humility, like Habakkuk does, but he is not afraid of our questions. He's not wringing his hands up there thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not sure how I'm going to answer that one. He doesn't have to answer our questions, by the way. 
but sometimes he does. And sometimes the form of his answer is, is very hard. That's the experience of Habakkuk. So Habakkuk is saying, you are a holy God. He knows this. He knows, like uh, the song that we sang, Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Do you know why he had to take off his sandals? Sandals are made of leather, right? Leather is the skin of a dead animal. You can't have anything dead between the living prophet and the living God. A little bit of Greek Orthodox uh, wisdom there. (laughs) So Habakkuk has a good question. But he's moving forward. And he said, yes, your people are bad. However, these guys are even worse. The Chaldeans are even worse. How can can you call that justice? You've solved one problem, but you've introduced, as far as Habakkuk can tell, he's saying you've introduced another one that's even harder, but he is still meek, and he is still humble, and he is still patient. He is still patient. And then he introduces an extended metaphor and he compares humans to fish. You know, they're just swimming along in the sea or in the in the river and boom, down comes the net and they don't know what's happened to them. But all of a sudden they're snatched up and they're they're dead. And he says, that's that's ultimately what we humans are like, isn't it? You know, we don't know when we're going to be taken, when we're going to die. We don't know if someone's going to get killed, if someone's going to die of an aneurysm or something like that. A heart attack, even, I mean, for young people, we've seen this happening a lot lately. It's, you know, it's really sad. We don't know these things. And that's what Habakkuk is saying. He's reflecting on the reality of justice. And the reality that God's justice is not like our justice. But then he receives a second oracle. A second oracle which contains these different woes, the curses of oppression. Uh, These woes, we see Jesus later on in his own career as a prophet. Now, he's more than just a prophet, but he is certainly a prophet. And he says, do you remember what it says? Woe to the towns of this region. Woe. Jesus is following that same prophetic tradition that we find right here. And God is saying, this is my instrument of justice, the Chaldeans, but I am very aware of their sins. And they too in their own day, will be punished. And these different sins, the curses on oppressors, are the explanation of the different sins of the Chaldeans. And then, what would have been your question after this? Well, then, who's going to destroy the Chaldeans? It's like the chicken and the egg, right? Who's going to destroy the Chaldeans? And are they going to be even worse than the Chaldeans? And then who's going to destroy them? It's actually the Persians who end up destroying the Chaldeans. And the Persians are not not very fantastic. Although the Persians have one thing in favor. They let the Jews go back to, uh, to Palestine to resettle the city of Jerusalem. So that's good. But then Habakkuk, he responds to all of this with the prayer, which is our text for today. Chapter 3. A plea to Yahweh for deliverance. A plea to Yahweh for deliverance. I like 3 2. Well, it says, Yahweh, I have heard of your renown, your work. Yahweh inspires me with dread. Repeat it in our own time, reveal it in our own time, for all your wrath, remember to be merciful. Some translations say, Revive, revive your old deeds in our time. And as everyone is talking about revival and praying for revival and trying to be optimistic for revival, um, this, uh, this, this verse seems important to me. Revive, renew your deeds. So what do we do when we look around us and see the increase in violence and injustice? I was talking with a mother of a kid, our daughter is 12, and she has encountered the fantastic experience of going to the American Mall. Uh, we have malls in Spain, but they're not like American malls. So she has enjoyed that, but this mother that I was talking to said, yeah, I don't think I would let my kids go to a mall today. And the reason is because, you know, what we've heard of, stuff that never happened when I was a kid, all the violence. 
when people in Europe, when they hear about school shootings, they're like, what's going on in America? I, I, I've got some sociological ideas for you, but I, I really can't tell you what exactly is going on. When we hear about the increase of violence and crime, what do we do? What do we do? We, like Habakkuk, are saying, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you in the midst of this difficulty? And so the first thing that Habakkuk does, and that I think we need to do as well, is to remember. To remember. You know, I love it in the Torah that anytime somebody has an experience with God, they build an altar. Right? And why did they do that? Because it would be a memorial so that they would always remember the things that God had done in the past. And we always need to do that. We, in the midst of our difficulties, whether it's personal difficulties in our own lives or for our church or for our city or the country or the world, we need to remember the great things that God has done in the past. And Habakkuk, that's what he's doing here in this great prayer of chapter 3. He is remembering events from the Exodus and from the conquest of the Holy Land in Joshua. If you have a study Bible, you can go through each one and it will give you the different, um, the different references. Were you angry at the rivers? Were you angry at the Nile when you cursed it in Exodus and it turned to blood? Were you angry at the River Jordan when you split it so the people could walk through? He talks about Midian and Cush. These are nations that are mentioned in uh, Exodus and Joshua. God has done great things. And Habakkuk is saying, renew, revive, bring back, do these great acts of deliverance again. But there's another element to it. Not only is he remembering what God did in the past, he is anticipating what God will do in the future. I teach Old Testament theology at a seminary, which is why I choose exotic passages like Habakkuk 3. And my students, you know, they're young and they, they love eschatology. They're like, so what happens according to the Old Testament? What are the end times like? And I say, well, you know, if you want to know how the Hebrews and the Israelites, how they thought of the end times, their thinking was, if you want to know what the end is like, look at the beginning. Think about like Revelation. What do you have in Revelation? You have a garden. Oh, we got a garden at the beginning. You got a snake. We got a snake at the beginning. Um, you've got a river coming out of the garden. We've got rivers at the beginning. You've got trees, not just one tree of, with the fruit of life. You've got a whole bunch of trees with the fruit of life. Oh, we've got that at the beginning. You've got the nations, but the nations are united before the throne. But we have the nations. They're divided at the beginning because they are in uh, you know, Babel, and they're building a name for themselves. But here in Revelation, they're coming together in the name of Jesus Christ, the name of God. What is the end like? Well, it's like the beginning. It's like the beginning. I think about this as we approach Lent. As we approach Lent, we're going to take 40 days to be with Israel in the desert as they are preparing to enter into the Holy Land. And that entrance to the Holy Land is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are also going to spend 40 days of some sort of discipline or abstinence, uniting ourselves to Jesus Christ, who was 40 days in the wilderness. But you know, the 40 years of Israel begins with rebellion, and then it ends with deliverance. After the old generation that was not faithful to Torah had died, and the new generation, a generation hopefully filled with faith, and confidence in God had been born. But it's symmetrical. The 40 days of Jesus begin with the revelation of the power of God in his baptism and the theophany of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then they end not with worshiping Baal, which is how the 40 years begin, but it ends with the Israel of God, Jesus Christ, being victorious over temptation and over Satan. So there's a little bit of theology for you um, as, we, as, we approach, as we approach Lent. I love what Habakkuk says. I am filled with fear and trembling is the old phrase. This is an old Hebrew 
phrase, these two words go together. Fear and trembling. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. And Habakkuk the prophet is considering the great things that God has done in the past. He is also considering the justice that will come from the Chaldeans to destroy and to discipline and to punish his own people. And he says, I am filled with fear and trembling. And then, let's look at the end of this beautiful passage. Verses 17 and 18. But that fear and trembling, that is a very appropriate place to have our souls during Lent. Fear and trembling. As we consider our sinfulness and try to really repent, get rid of all the leaven that is there, and prepare ourselves to be raised to new life with our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a Lent with fear and trembling. And in spite of all of this, this difficult message that Habakkuk has received, he is able to conclude with some beautiful words. 17 and 18. Sorry, a little bit hard to read. But I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will exalt, exult in God my Savior. Yahweh is Lord, is my Lord, is my strength. Sorry, Yahweh my Lord is my strength. He makes my feet as light as a doe's. He sets my steps on the heights. And I love the final words for the choir master on stringed instruments. So let me finish with just three observations here that I think we can put into practice in our own lives. The first thing is that rejoicing, rejoicing in Yahweh is a decision. It's not based on everything being fine and being great. Because look at the situation of Habakkuk, right? He's got, first of all, as a prophet, a really, really tough message to bring to his congregation. I would not want that job. I would not want to have to preach these sermons that come out of this conversation with God. But he is going to rejoice in spite of that because he knows that God knows the long plan. God knows what's going to happen down the road. God is able to redeem and use things in ways that we cannot even consider or contemplate. But I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will exult in God my Savior. Yahweh my Lord is my strength. He makes my feet as light as a doe's. He sets my steps on the heights. Two possibilities here. This is a famous verse, but it's a little bit mysterious. Well, the first thing, though, is that Habakkuk appears to be saying, I will be like a deer on the heights. I don't know if you've walked around on the rocky mountains of Palestine. I have. They're not easy to walk around on. It's not easy. It's not an easy geography to have a firm footing, to have stability, to be secure. But amazingly, the deer and the goats as well, they're able to somehow do it. And Habakkuk, because he trusts in God's faithfulness, knows that he will be safe. And then finally, and this is the last one, for the choir master on stringed instruments. How am I going to get an application out of this, you ask? Well, here you go. Habakkuk has taken a profoundly personal interior experience, a struggle, a fight, right? What does Israel mean? The one who wrestles with God. God's not afraid of us asking questions, and he's not afraid of us wrestling with him. God loves it when we wrestle with him. He wants a people of God who will not just sit back and say, well, let's see what happens next. He wants us to be forceful and to wrestle with him, like Habakkuk has in his heart and in his soul. But then Habakkuk takes that difficult experience, and he says, I have to share that with the people of God. I'm going to take this whole difficult experience, my wrestling with God, and I'm going to share that, share the fruit of it with the people of God. So, in conclusion, brothers and sisters, let us try to be like Habakkuk. Let us embrace God in the midst of doubt and difficulty and, honestly, a, a situation, a social situation, economic situation uh, that is not always, not always under, easy for us to understand when we see violence and injustice and corruption. 
Let us make the decision to rejoice in God. And let us take the fruit of our conversation, of our growth, of our rustling with God, and let us share that with the people around us to encourage them and to call people to know the one true God. Amen.